Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this webinar. My name is Shaholm Roy, and I'm the Director of Pediatric Otolaryngology for the University of Texas at Houston Systems. I'm also the Director of Pediatric ENT for Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital and for Memorial Hermann Healthcare Systems. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about an introduction to pediatric ENT disorders, what we like to call the ABCs of pediatric ENT. Now, unfortunately, because this is being pre-recorded, we're not going to have the live feedback to discuss questions and answers, but I will leave some time at the end for questions with some information about how you can contact me for questions or comments or things you would like to discuss. I thought by starting I'd tell you a little bit about myself. So before I moved here to Houston, I was actually in practice in Miami, Florida, and I was at the University of Miami for about eight years. And here's a picture of the view from my balcony of my apartment. And you can see Miami Beach to the left and Key Biscayne to the right. And after about eight years in Miami, I was invited to come to Houston to look at a position here in Houston and they said it's a wonderful place to practice, it's a terrific place to, uh, to be a physician and I promise we'll even upgrade your view and this is the new view from my parking lot in Houston so uh, everything else turned out to be true although the view was not necessarily upgraded the same. So let's start first by talking about what an ENT is, because I am frequently confused for being an EMT or a paramedic or an emergency medical technician. I'm a medical physician, and ear, nose, and throat specialists are medical physicians, and you will frequently hear us referred to as ear, nose, and throat specialists. Formally, we are actually called an otolaryngologist, which is a fancy Latin way of referring to the ears and the throat, or sometimes, as in my department, we will call it an otorhinolaryngologist, meaning specifically ear, nose, and throat specialist, also known as head and neck surgeons. And informally speaking, that means that we take care of everything involving the head, the neck, and the face that doesn't include the spine and the brain specifically. But we take care of everything in the head, neck, and the face all the way down to the chest. And that includes, but is not limited to, things like the tonsils, the sinuses, people who have allergy problems. We take care of head and neck cancers and cancers of the head, neck, and throat. Cosmetic surgery of the nose, face, and eyes, including dizziness and other ear problems and voice issues. Even within the specialty of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery or ear, nose, and throat surgery, there are subspecialty areas within our field. I am a particular, uh, I have a particular interest in pediatric otolaryngology, so I take care of, of kids almost exclusively. There are also specialists in rhinology or sinus surgery, and here at Memorial Hermann we have some outstanding and internationally renowned sinus and skull based surgeons. Uh, we also have a strong program in head and neck cancer surgery. Uh, there is a very strong program for ear surgery and base of skull surgery. And of course, uh, ENTs also cover facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, and that includes both reconstructive surgery of the face and neck in addition to cosmetic surgeries of the face and neck. And we have specialists in voice disorders who handle what we call laryngology or disorders of the voice, uh, speech, and swallowing. So how do you end up where I am in this situation? Well, for people who do ENT, after completing medical school, we do a year of internship in general surgery, followed by four years of residency in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery in our specialty area. And then after that, you can pursue fellowship training. And in my case, I did two years of pediatric ear, nose, and throat surgery, or pediatric otolaryngology and head and neck surgery. Uh, to become a specialist in pediatric ear, nose, and throat disorders. Frequently, I am confused for being a pediatrician. And I will tell you that your pediatricians know a lot more about general pediatric diseases than I ever will. I know a lot of things about pediatric ear, nose, and throat disorders, but you don't want to ask me about things like your child's constipation because I would not be the right person to give you the best advice. So I work very closely with your pediatricians to take, help take care of your child from a multidisciplinary standpoint, and I work very closely with the pediatricians to help in the care of these kids who, uh, who need our assistance. So let's start by talking about the ears. Now, the ears, to me, are a very particular uh, place of interest because pediatric ear, nose, and throat specialists deal a lot with ear infections in young children. So the ear can be divided into essentially three important parts. There's the outer part of the ear, and forgive me while I figure out how to use this little arrow pointer here. So there's the outer part of the ear, and the outer part of the ear includes the cartilaginous ear and the ear lobe down here. There's also the outer part of the ear, including the ear canal, and the ear canal is where we're very susceptible to developing things like ear canal infections, or swimmer's ear, often referred to as otitis externa. 
Beyond the ear canal, we have the eardrum, which you can see in cross-section here. And here is the eardrum, visible here. And behind the eardrum, we have the middle ear. And the middle ear is essentially a cavity. It's a small space where fluid can accumulate. So frequently, when children or parents say they have an inner ear infection, what they're actually referring to is they have a middle ear infection, which are the most common types of infection in kids involving this middle ear cavity. So when we talk about ear infections in children, frequently what we're referring to are infections of the middle ear cavity behind the eardrum itself. Behind the eardrum, you can see indicated here, are the bones of hearing. And there are three bones of hearing called the auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And effectively, how we hear is that sound travels through the ear canal here, and it travels down the ear canal, hits the eardrum, causing the eardrum to vibrate. When the eardrum vibrates, that causes the bones of hearing to move. And as the bones of hearing move, this causes a fluid shift here in the inner ear structures. So this middle ear cavity has the hearing bones that connect to the inner ear indicated here. And the inner ear is what translates that energy into sound waves into the nerve. So here, deeper into the ear, we see the actual true inner ear, which includes the balance canals, which you can see up here. And it also includes the cochlea, which is the organ that helps us hear uh, from our brain. This is the organ that translates those sound waves into electrical signals down into this nerve, which goes straight into the brain. And everything in this area is brain tissue. So you can see how closely when we work in the ear, we're actually working to the brain, which is why we have to pay so much attention to our anatomy of the ear. Certainly, one of the other important things to remember in children is that the middle ear cavity is connected to the back of the nose through this tube here called the eustachian tube. Now, the eustachian tube we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, but the eustachian tube has a very important role in the development of middle ear diseases. So the middle ear has cells that secrete mucus and fluid, and typically they drain down the eustachian tube into the back of the nose. But if your eustachian tube is not working properly, fluid will not drain appropriately from the middle ear and not drain appropriately into the back of the nose, which can result in a fluid buildup here in the middle ear. At the same time, we frequently will blow air up through the eustachian tube from our noses to help air get into the middle ear. And if a eustachian tube doesn't work properly, air can't get up into the middle ear to help keep the eardrum in a good position. So this is similar to what we think about when you're on an airplane and you're clearing your ears. When you pinch your nose and blow some air, what you're really doing is blowing some air up through your eustachian tube into the middle ear, causing air to get up into your ears, and that's why you feel your ears pop when you're on an airplane. So really, to remember, there are just three areas. There's the outer part of the ear, which includes the cartilaginous part of the ear and the ear canal. There's the middle ear, which is the eardrum, the hearing bones, and the cavity here. And then the inner ear, which contains the cochlea for hearing, uh, which translates uh, sound waves into hearing, and the balance canals called the labyrinth. Now, with that as an understanding, of what can cause uh, or what how the ear works from an anatomic standpoint. There are different types of hearing loss depending on where the problem occurs. First, there's conductive hearing loss. And conductive hearing loss in children is most frequently caused by fluid or infection of the middle ear. So as we talked about before, let's see if I can make that arrow work again. Um, as we talked about before, when there's fluid in the middle ear here, the eardrum does not vibrate appropriately. And if the eardrum doesn't vibrate appropriately, then the bones of hearing don't vibrate appropriately, which means that sound doesn't get transmitted down here into the inner ear appropriately. So any sort of fluid or obstruction in the middle ear with an ear infection will prevent the eardrum and bones of hearing from vibrating appropriately, which will result in some type of what we call conductive hearing loss. In a conductive hearing loss, the nerve works just fine, but the mechanism to transmit sound from the eardrum down to the bones of hearing does not transmit appropriately. In a similar manner, any sort of problem with the bones of hearing can cause conductive hearing loss because, again, if the bones are abnormal, then they don't vibrate appropriately to get sound to transmit. So in those cases, frequently, we will see either bony fixation, where the bone is fixed and doesn't move appropriately, or some sort of abnormality that the ear was born with, with an abnormality of the bone itself. Now, that type of hearing loss is very different from what we call sensory neural hearing loss. In sensory neural hearing loss, these middle ear structures, including the eardrum and bones of hearing, and 
middle ear cavity are normal, but the nerve itself or the cochlea are not working appropriately. And frequently, parents get these issues confused. So children have very frequent ear infections, and they may have a little bit of conductive hearing loss related to fluid in the middle ear, but they're worried that this has caused nerve deafness or left the child permanently disabled or damaged, when in fact, usually that is not the case. Nerve hearing loss is a very different problem, and that can affect one or both ears, and it can be anywhere from very mild to severe and even cause deafness. Sometimes that's something from birth related to an abnormality in the way the inner ear was developed, but it can also be acquired from infections, from high-risk neonatal care, and even from certain medications. But this type of hearing loss, sensory neural, is much less common in children than conductive hearing loss, which is frequently caused by ear infections. So even if your child has ear infections or fluid in the ear and they have a little hearing loss, it's unlikely that that's going to result in permanent nerve damage, and in fact is just related to this conduction mechanism rather than any damage to the inner ear or nerves itself. So it's important to keep those two separate types of hearing loss distinct in your mind, and there is sometimes some crossover between the two, but your ear, nose, and throat specialist will help you sort those out to help you figure out what type of hearing loss we're addressing and what needs to be done about it. Uh, just a couple of arrows. Okay, now, that being said, let's talk about middle ear infections. Middle ear infections come in a variety of different forms. First, there is recurrent acute otitis media. And in recurrent otitis media, we're talking about multiple ear infections caused by either bacteria or viruses. And typical middle ear infections have some classic signs and symptoms. Kids with middle ear infections frequently have ear pain and high fevers. Young children may be fussy or irritable. They frequently wake up in the middle of the night from screaming. You may see some drainage from the ear during a rupture of the, the eardrum itself. And they may have some temporary uh, hearing loss, as we mentioned, because of the fluid building up in the middle ear. Kids who get episodes of high fever, ear pain, uh, frequently do have episodes of acute otitis media or middle ear infection. And when we develop more than a couple of middle ear infections, that's when we develop what we call recurrent acute otitis media. Now, that is slightly different from what we call otitis media with effusion. And in otitis media with effusion, you don't have the high fevers, the pain, and the irritability of an acute active bacterial infection or viral infection of the middle ear. In otitis media with effusion, we have sterile fluid that sticks behind the eardrum that hasn't cleared. Now, fluid behind the eardrum, or an effusion as we call it, can come from one of two places. It can either be left over as a result of a previous middle ear infection. After the infection resolves, they may frequently have uh, they may frequently have some fluid left over in the ear, or fluid can occur in the ear as a totally separate process, not related to a previous ear infection. Kids who have persistent fluid in the ears will frequently have some hearing loss, and they may develop delayed speech and learning simply because they don't hear very well. Um, this, over the long term, if left untreated, can potentially cause damage to the bones of hearing or the eardrum. And parents often ask me, what are the risk factors for developing ear infections or fluid in the middle ear? And there are some very well-known risk factors. And probably the number one preventable risk factor is daycare. Uh, daycare is a fact of life for most children. Unfortunately, in daycare, if you ever see what happens, the kids touch their faces, and they wipe snot on their hands, and then they touch one another, and then touch their faces. And so they're just passing snot back and forth with bacteria and viruses to one another. Secondhand cigarette smoke is a very well-known risk factor for ear infections and fluid in the middle ear. And invariably, parents tell me, well, we don't smoke in the house, we smoke outside. But if you come back inside and you pick your child up, they're going to breathe in cigarette smoke, which is very irritating to the back of the nose and causes irritation to that eustachian tube that I pointed to earlier, which can cause uh, uh, irritation to the ear and fluid buildup or ear infection problems. So I always counsel parents that if they do smoke, Please smoke outdoors, and when you come inside, change your clothes and wash your hands before you pick up your child, and that will help reduce their ear infections as well. Certainly, allergies may play a role, and there is a huge component for genetics, so parents who had ear infections as children are much more likely to have children with ear infections in their childhood. And there are other high-risk groups, including kids who have cleft palate, kids who have Down syndrome or other craniofacial syndromes, 
which increases the likelihood of developing ear fluid or ear infection problems. Now, as I mentioned, the eustachian tube plays a vital role in the development of ear infections. And to refresh your memory, the eustachian tube is this little cartilaginous tube here that extends down from the middle ear cavity, and it opens into the back of the nose. And it allows fluid to drain down the middle ear into the back of the nose, and also allows air from your nose to get up into the middle ear. Now, unfortunately, in children, the eustachian tube doesn't look like this. You can see the eustachian tube has a nice steep downward slope, but in kids, the eustachian tube is, in fact, much shorter. It's also much floppier, and it doesn't function as well. And part of the reason is because the angle is not as steep. And you can see in this cartoon over here, the eustachian tube is actually quite flat in children. It doesn't have gravity working in its favor. So in kids, eustachian tubes tend to be shorter. They're at a worse angle because they're more like horizontal rather than up and down. And they don't function as well because they're floppier. And all of those things contribute to fluid building up and ear infections in the middle ear itself. In addition, the adenoid gland, which sits in the back of the nose, you frequently hear of people having tonsil and adenoid problems, the adenoid gland indicated here sits right where the opening of the eustachian tube is. This is why frequently your ear, nose, and throat specialist may mention to you that the adenoid tissue is contributing to the middle ear infection problem, and that removal of the adenoid tissue may also help with improving ear fluid or ear infections. And again, that's all because the adenoid tissue is sitting right at the opening of the eustachian tube. And if there's a bunch of bacteria or viruses built up in the adenoid tissue, it can seed infections going back up the eustachian tube into the middle ear. So there's a strong relationship for us as ear, nose, and throat specialists between the adenoid tissue, the eustachian tube, and the middle ear, and how those all come together to create uh, middle ear infections and middle ear fluid. This is a cartoon of a middle ear infection. This is not a normal, healthy middle ear. I'm going to show you a picture of a normal, healthy eardrum as we might see it in a child's ear. This is a bulging out eardrum. And you can see the eardrum looks like it's about to pop. It's like a balloon that's completely overfilled, in this case, with pus. And the eardrum is exquisitely sensitive. And this is why so many kids who have ear infections are in excruciating pain. For any adults out there watching this webinar, if you've ever had a middle ear infection, one of the things you will never forget about it is it is extremely painful. And it's, it's just very uncomfortable because your eardrum's being stretched unbelievably uh, hard like this. One other thing you may notice is if your child ruptures their eardrum, as soon as it ruptures, all the pus drains out and the eardrum's no longer under all that pressure. I mean, and typically the pain will go away almost instantly. It's like having a pimple as soon as you drain it and get all the pus out, uh, your pain gets better, but that helps relieve the tension. But otherwise, in a child with an intact eardrum like this and pus behind it, that can be extremely painful uh, for the child. So here you can see what a normal, healthy eardrum looks like. And the normal, healthy eardrum is clear and shiny, and you can see all the way through it into the middle ear cavity. And this is showing the eardrum and middle ear cavity here, the area that we're referring to. Now, these three pictures on the right are abnormal eardrums. So here, you can see fluid in the ear. And look at the difference in the color between the two ears. Here in a normal eardrum, it's nice and clear. You can see some light shining back at you when we're looking down the ear with our light called an otoscope. You can actually see some of the bones of hearing sitting against the eardrum here. This is a normal ear. Over in an ear with fluid, you can see how it looks yellow. And it looks yellow because there's mucus, which is the same as snot from your nose. That's actually snot in the middle ear that you can see behind the eardrum. And you can actually see a few bubbles here of a little air mixed in with the fluid. So this is a child who has fluid in the ear. This is an active ear infection. So you can see the difference between fluid in the ear and an active ear infection. In an active ear infection, the eardrum is bulging outward, and there's pus, that hot, white-looking pus behind the eardrum that is extremely painful for kids. When the pus dies and the infection resolves, it can leave this thick, stringy, mucus-like fluid behind in the ear. So this is an acute otitis media or active eardrum. And this is otitis media with effusion or fluid in the middle ear. This is a picture of what we call a retraction pocket. A retraction pocket is where the eardrum has sustained a little bit of damage. And instead of sitting like a nice lid on a bowl, it's sort of sucked inward. And you can 
can see with the green arrow, you can see where the eardrum is just kind of diving away from you. That's a little pocket that is sucked inward as a result of not getting air up into the middle ear to allow the ear to maintain good pressures. And this is always a concern because this can structurally damage the eardrum or structurally damage the bones of hearing and the middle ear that may require further intervention down the road. So in regards to ear infections, when should you see an ear, nose, and throat specialist? Typically, this is recommended for children who have had recurrent episodes of acute ear infection or acute otitis media. And for us, we define this as three distinct infections in a six-month period or four infections in a 12-month period if one of them was recent. So once your child starts to have three infections in a six-month period, that's when you want to talk to your pediatrician and say, hey, maybe we need to consider seeing an ENT at this point. Certainly if your child has any major risk factors for ear infections. So if a child has Down syndrome or a cleft palate or any other concerns for speech and language delay, those kids should be referred to an ENT specialist for ear infections. And whenever there's a concern for a potential complication like a hole in the eardrum, any sort of hearing loss or speech or language delay, or if there's any concern for a spread of infection out of the ear into other valuable parts of the body, like the brain or down into the neck, then of course you want to make sure you see a specialist at that point. And finally, the most common reason is the last one listed, which is kids who either fail to get better from an infection or who have fluid that doesn't go away. So if fluid doesn't go away, that can cause hearing problems and speech and language delays. And in that case, those children will like to, or we would recommend that child be evaluated by an ENT specialist uh, for further recommendations and treatment. Now, typically, when a child has that many episodes of ear infection or has fluid in the ear with hearing loss, we will frequently suggest tympanostomy tubes. Tympanostomy tubes, you may also hear referred to as meringotomy tubes or ear tubes. They're all the same thing. Those are all interchangeable words for the same problem. Now, ear tubes have some advantages, and they also have some disadvantages. And I want to just review those because a lot of parents have questions about whether their children should get tubes or not. It's important to remember that tubes have uh, a couple of significant advantages. First of all, they reduce the number of ear infections that they get. So for example, if a child has six ear infections in a year, if you place tubes in their ears, you can expect that they'll get maybe one or two ear infections with the tubes in. It's not zero, so it's not a curative thing. Having tubes in your ears does not magically cure you from ever having an ear infection again but it does significantly reduce the number of infections that you have and significantly makes it easier on the parents because they're just not back at the doctor's office as often as they were before. It's not a cure, but it does reduce the number of infections that they're having. The second major advantage is that it reduces the severity of the symptoms involved. So typically when a child has an ear infection, as I mentioned, the eardrum gets stretched out, they have severe pain and fevers, and they may feel significant pressure in the ear. Well, when you have a tube in the ear and you develop an infection, it drains out through the tube. So you can't develop the severe pain and the fevers or that pressure sensation in the ear. And, and typically what we see is the child just has drainage coming from the ear. And just like when you wake up with a cold with a runny nose, if you have an ear infection with tubes in, you'll wake up with a runny ear. Not painful, not the high fevers, not all the discomfort and the waking in the middle of the night screaming, just a runny ear that smells bad. The third major advantage is if you have a tube in the ear, uh, you, can, uh, you can treat the ear infection much better. So instead of giving antibiotics by mouth for your ear infections, we can t treat the ear infection with ear drops containing antibiotics in them directly into the infected middle ear, which gives us a very high cure rate because you're giving a very strong concentration of antibiotic directly into the ear itself without having to give antibiotics by mouth. And frequently, one of the concerns that parents voice to me is their child has been on too many antibiotics by mouth and they're worried about developing resistance, which is a real concern. The nice thing is those limited episodes of drainage from the ear tubes with the infection means that we can treat them with just ear drops with antibiotics, and very rarely do we even need antibiotics by mouth anymore. So three major advantages of tubes, 
fewer number of infections, fewer severity of symptoms, and the ear infections become much easier to treat than ear infections without tubes. However, there are disadvantages of tubes in the ears. Tubes are an operation, and make no mistake about it, they are an operation. And while we do them in the office in certain children and in adults, most kids in particular are going to require general anesthesia to have tubes put in. Now, the general anesthetic to put tubes in the ears is very brief. It typically takes less than 10 minutes, and it usually is a very simple thing where we give a little gas by mask and we don't even put in an IV or a breathing tube. However, it is still an operation, and whenever we have an operation, there are risks of bad things happening, even though they are extremely rare. But because bad things can happen in surgery, we always recommend that, that any type of surgical procedure only be undertaken once it's been really thoroughly thought out, including a discussion of the risks, the benefits, the complications, and the alternatives to surgery. Never enter into surgery on a whim or on instinct. You should always think it through very carefully because we want to know that we're making a good decision for you and your child. While tubes are in the ears, we frequently will recommend that the ears stay dry, and parents often ask me about swimming when kids have ear tubes in. Swimming is usually considered okay by most people, but typically kids who are going to do any deep diving, we recommend they wear earplugs to keep water out of the tubes. Tubes can fall out too early, or they can stay too long, which is why once your child has tubes in the ears, we do recommend very regular follow-up of those tubes with your ear, nose, and throat specialist. And in rare cases, the tube can leave a hole in the eardrum. And parents often ask me, oh my gosh, that sounds horrible. What do we do if there's a hole in the eardrum? Well, the first thing is don't panic because having a hole in the eardrum is not the end of the world. It's not going to significantly impact them too badly. And it is the type of thing that we can usually go back and fix with a small operation to graft that hole in the eardrum and close it. And as I mentioned to you, ear tubes can drain, which is a common phenomenon in kids who get an ear infection after they have tubes placed, although it is not nearly as frequent as before they uh, had the tubes placed. Here's just a picture of a hole in the eardrum. You'll notice that the hole is in the same location where an ear tube would typically be. Um, and it's about the size of the tube itself. So in this case, the tube left a hole in the eardrum. And if this does not heal on its own, then your surgeon may recommend going back and closing that hole. So as I mentioned, tympanostomy tubes are also known as myringotomy tubes or pressure equalization tubes or ear tubes. And you can see a picture of what the tube looks like here. Tubes come in a variety of shapes and colors. There are different reasons to use different types of tubes and some of that will be on the particular needs of your child. And in other cases, it has to do more with the surgeon's preference or what the surgeon feels is the best fit for your child's ear. As we've mentioned, the indications for ear tube placement may include fluid in the ears lasting for more than three months, multiple ear infections, and by that we mean three infections in a six-month period or four infections in a 12-month period, hearing loss from fluid in the ears, or kids who have become resistant to antibiotics will frequently be suggested for having tubes placed. As I mentioned, it's an outpatient surgery. It's done under general anesthesia, and typically it takes us between 7 and 10 minutes. Tubes will typically come out anywhere from 6 months to 24 months after surgery. Sometimes it's a little earlier than 6 months. Other times they stay too long and may have to be removed down the road. Another important thing to remember, and thinking back to that initial anatomy of the ear that we talked about, uh, ear tubes are placed through the ear canal into the eardrum itself, and we make a small incision on the eardrum right here, and then we put a tube across that incision. You cannot see anything from the outside. This is all done through the ear itself. There are no cuts or scars on the outside, and the tubes cannot be seen by anybody unless you actually look into the ear with our otoscope to actually see what's going on in the ear itself. So some parents often ask me, well, do we use water precautions with ear tubes? And yes, water precautions are sometimes very helpful. And that means when you're swimming or bathing, if the child likes to put their head under water in the bathtub, frequently your, your surgeon will recommend wearing earplugs in those cases. But that's not a guarantee, and different people have different philosophies about whether a child's ear should stay dry after uh, tubes are placed. And finally, to just discuss the pros and cons again, as I mentioned, ear tubes decrease the number of infections. They make it 
ear infections easier to treat with ear drops. You have fewer oral antibiotics. And most importantly, there's a lot of good scientific data looking at the quality of life for children and for parents after kids have ear tubes. And it turns out that the parent's quality of life improves the same or more than the child's quality of life because they're no longer going back to the doctor's office all the time. The kids miss less school and parents miss less work. We talked about some potential complications, including the tube coming out too early or staying in too long, need for additional tubes or a hole in the eardrum or chronic ear drainage, both, all of which are relatively rare. So that's all I want to say about middle ear infections. Another day, if we do another webinar, we'll talk about some of these other unusual uh, conditions with the ears, including what's called a microtia. And this means it's a very small ear. Uh, skin tags, which sometimes appear just in front of the ear. Lesions of the skin itself of the ear that may require surgical excision. Or this chronically infected ear. And you can see a hole in the eardrum here. You can see how beefy red and all the pus is here. That's a chronically infected ear that's going to require some additional treatment for their uh, chronic ear infection. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the nose. Now, the nose is obviously a different entity because we have different areas of the nose that we like to discuss. And it's important to remember that there's the outer part of the nose, which is the part that we see on our faces. There's the inside part of the nose. And the inside part of the nose has these fleshy growths here called the turbinates. And the turbinates are very important because they have mucous membranes on them. And those mucous membranes serve a couple of important purposes. Uh, they humidify. Whoops, I pressed the wrong button here. I hope that didn't do anything bad. Um, they humidify the uh, middle ear, or they humidify the nose, and they warm the nose as well. So when you breathe air through your nose, these fleshy looking things here help provide humidity and help provide uh, uh, warmth to the air coming in. And it also helps filter out allergens, bacteria, uh, viruses, and other impurities in the air itself. This is a CT scan uh, from the front view, and this is a CT of the side view of a child's head. And the reason I put these up here is to talk a little bit about the sinuses. And I frequently get parents coming in saying, oh, my child has terrible sinus infections. Remember that not all of a child's sinuses are even developed yet. And in fact, the sinuses frequently don't develop until you're a little older. Typically, we have four pairs of sinuses. Two occur over in the cheek. To occur in this honeycomb pattern between the eyes. There's a separate set further back in the nose back here. And you develop a set in the forehead up here. So there are four pairs of these sinus cavities. But you don't develop this, the pair back here and the pair up here until you're much older. So frequently, young children may not even have good development of their sinuses yet. And what we diagnose as a quote unquote sinus infection may actually just be a nasal infection or an infection of the adenoid. Now, I mentioned the adenoid tissue before. The adenoid tissue actually sits in the back of the nose back here. And the adenoid plays a very important role, as I mentioned, first of all, because of the eustachian tube and where it sits, that it can seed middle ear infections. But when the adenoid is large enough, it can also cause nasal obstruction and cause chronic runny noses. So frequently in young children, when a child comes to me with a diagnosis of, quote, chronic sinus infections, in fact, what they have is a chronic adenoid infection and a relatively simple procedure to remove the adenoid will frequently fix their chronic nasal drainage and chronic mouth breathing and nasal airway obstruction. The septum is a little cartilaginous and bony midpoint of the nose. And it goes up and down here right in the center. And if you look in your own nose, it's right in the middle part of your nose. And you can see the plate on either side if you just look into your own nostrils. That is the septum. And frequently, people will talk about a deviated septum. Deviated septums are actually somewhat rarer in children. And they tend to occur a little less frequently because they haven't sustained the same kinds of nasal traumas yet that we sustain as we get older. And also, the tear ducts actually actually drain right under here, underneath this turbinate area. The tear duct actually drains down into the nose, which is why frequently people who are crying a lot will have a stuffy nose, because they're actually draining down into the nasal cavity. OK, let me see what I'm doing with the arrow here. So in kids, the nose can have a number of different problems. And probably the biggest one is congestion or stuffiness of the nose. And nasal congestion and stuffiness can come from a variety of different places. It can come from those turbinates, those fleshy outgrowths. It can come from the sinuses. It can come from the adenoids. And your ENT doctor will help you sort out where the problem seems to be coming from. Enlarged adenoids are also known to cause snoring and sinusitis. We frequently see nosebleeds in young kids. The number one cause of nosebleeds 
safety of children, in case you didn't know, is picking your nose. So the first question your ENT doctor is going to ask you when your child comes in for nosebleeds is, has your child been scratching or picking at the nose, rubbing their nose, or putting their fingers in it? Because whenever you put your fingers in the nose, there are some blood vessels on the front of the nose that get very irritable. And if you irritate those blood vessels, you'll start getting nosebleeds. Less commonly are things like masses in the nose. And sometimes we deal with narrowing of the nose, either in the outer part of the nose or in the back of the nose in newborn infants. Now, rhinosinusitis and true rhinosinusitis can be very difficult to diagnose in children. Typically, when a child has a true sinus infection, and you can see on the CT scan here, as opposed to the other CT scan where there was a lot of good black air in the sinuses, here there's all this gray stuff, and that's just thickened mucous membranes from chronic sinus infections. And those thickened mucous membranes cause thick secretions in the nose and thick nasal drainage. Kids who have a sinus infection will frequently have a cough, bad breath, and yellow-green stuff draining from their nose. Clear stuff draining from the nose is usually not infected. But yellow-green stuff draining from the nose may indicate a chronic or acute bacterial or viral infection. Kids who have true sinusitis may also have some other more systemic symptoms, like irritability, low levels of energy, or complaining of fatigue, or just not feeling well. And it is sometimes associated with headache, but not all headaches are caused by sinusitis. And in fact, headache is about third on the list, or I'm sorry, sinusitis is about third on the list for kids who have headaches. And depending on the specifics of when the symptoms occurred and how frequently they've been occurring, your physician may or may not choose to treat you with antibiotics if they're necessary. Frequently, we will use nasal steroids because that helps reduce the inflammation in the nose itself. Antihistamines are sometimes used for a child with stuffy nose. Uh, sometimes we will use oral steroids like prednisone. A uh, really good thing to use are sinus rinses. And sinus rinses may be one of the most useful things for children with chronic rhinosinusitis. And you can see a picture of this here. This is using a, something called the sinus rinse from NeilMed, which we recommend or I recommend to my patients. It works wonderfully. Uh, it's similar to a neti pot, only without the feeling of being being waterboarded. So the sinus rinse, you can squeeze that up into the nose and it helps irrigate all that thick mucus out of the nose and that frequently will help children feel better uh, in addition to other allergy treatments. And true sinusitis has a number of predisposing factors. And the exact relationship between all these things is unclear. But your ear, nose, and throat specialist will help you figure out which of these things are contributing to your child's chronic, uh, chronic uh, runny nose. So certainly, kids who have viral infections are very prone to developing sinusitis. Viral infections will cause the sinuses to get congested and prevent them from draining properly, which can result in a bacterial sinus infection. We've already discussed the role of the adenoid for seeding infections from bacteria and viruses that are plugged up in the adenoid gland itself. It also causes a mechanical obstruction in the back of the nose. And if air doesn't get into the nose, then bacteria and viruses can grow. There's certainly a component of allergy that may be figuring into it. We worry about immune deficiency in certain kids and cystic fibrosis, which is relatively rare. But also, as I mentioned, daycare is a major risk factor because the kids pass viruses and bacteria back and forth. We also look for anatomical obstruction, either from adenoids or anatomical abnormalities of the sinus themselves, environmental exposures become an issue like secondhand smoke, and then other things like reflux and asthma may be contributing factors for sinusitis as well. And your ear, nose, and throat specialist can help you sort those things out uh, to help get your child's symptoms under control. Now, one important thing to remember is that Surgical therapy for chronic runny noses is usually reserved as a last resort for a child who's failed all their medical therapies. If somebody immediately jumps into telling you surgery in a non-emergency situation, be a little bit wary because surgery can frequently be deferred for many children who can be treated medically. When we do surgical treatment for chronic sinus infections, the first line therapy is typically adenoidectomy because just getting out the adenoid gland frequently will help with the chronic sinus obstruction and a chronic nasal drainage. And we're going to talk about adenoidectomy in a minute. We do it through the mouth. And it doesn't really matter how big the adenoid is, because even a small adenoid, if it's chronically infected, can cause the sinuses and the nose to have chronic nasal drainage and chronic nasal infection. Frequently, we will do adenoidectomy at the same time with tonsillectomy for kids who are snoring. 
Kids who get sinus surgery, true endoscopic sinus surgery, are those kids who have failed all other treatments and have refractory sinus infections. In those cases, we may actually go in and open up the sinuses to improve your drainage and ventilation, which allows for better access to medicine to be delivered into the sinus cavity. Now, sinus surgery is very rarely completely curative for kids who have chronic sinus infections. Uh, more reasonable expectations is that they'll have fewer symptoms, less frequent ear infections, and less nasal drainage, and that their symptoms will get a little bit better, but it is frequently not curative. But again, endoscopic sinus surgery in general is really refractory therapy for kids who have severe sinus infections that simply do not get better. That's all I'm going to say about the nose and sinuses for now. Another day we'll talk about things like orbital cellulitis. And if your child wakes up with a big, red, hot, swollen eye like this and they've had a cold recently, if an, if an urgent care center tells you it's a bug bite, be very wary because this in young kids frequently indicates a sinus infection that has spread to the eye. The sinuses are bounded by the eye on one side and the brain on the other side. And sinus infections can spread in children because the bone that separates the sinuses from the eye is in fact very thin. And so a sinus infection can spread to the eye, causing uh, redness and swelling around the eye. And that's a serious condition that needs to be treated aggressively. So that's a, if you see this happen to your child, that's a warning sign. We're not going to talk today about tumors in the nose or polyps in the nose. And that's a picture of a severely deviated septum, because these are other more sort of tertiary issues that we can cover another day in more detail about them. So let's move on to the mouth and throat. And in kids, probably the number one issue that we talk about is snoring and sleep apnea, which is a type of snoring of more severe snoring. When we do an exam of your child's mouth and throat, we're looking at a couple of things. We're going to look at their teeth. We want to look at the palate. And the palate has two separate parts. There's a hard palate, which is the roof of your mouth. And then there's the soft palate, which is the softer part in the back that helps you swallow, including the uvula, which is that little thing hanging down from the throat. The tonsils themselves are on either side of the uvula behind the soft palate. And it's bounded by the soft palate on, on either side. And and those tonsils can, in fact, become quite large and cause snoring and breathing problems. And of course, we're also going to look at the salivary ducts, which come both in the cheek and underneath the tongue, and look at the tongue itself. We frequently see kids with large tonsils and adenoids who have uh, breathing problems. We will often talk about tongue tie. And tongue tie, thankfully, what happens is right here under the tongue, there's a little band right under the tongue that can be too short. And if it's too short, you can't stick your tongue out. You can't move it up and down or side to side. And that can cause speech and articulation problems in older children. And in younger children, it can cause them to have problems breastfeeding or latching onto a nipple because they simply can't move their tongue well enough to form the seal. And we will frequently talk to you about a procedure to release the tongue tie. Certain children are very prone to developing what we call macroglossia, or an enlargement of the tongue. And sometimes they may need tongue reduction surgery to help fit their tongue back into their mouth. There are other things like cysts and lumps and bumps in the mouth, and nasal speech, which we're not going to get into today, which is usually related to a palatal problem. Now, tonsillitis is probably the most common thing, or the second most common thing that we deal with in the throat. And people always ask me, well, what are your tonsils, and what do you need them for? Well, tonsils are part of your body's immune system. And it's, in fact, lymphoid tissue. So just like you have lymph nodes in your neck that get swollen when you get a cold, or you have lymph nodes in your groin or in your armpits that get swollen when you get sick, the tonsils are just like lymphoid tissue. It's only that they're exposed in the mouth, in the back of the throat, to the outside world. Now, Bacteria or viruses can cause your tonsils to become infected and inflamed. And the most common one is strep. So when people say strep throat, what they're actually talking about is a tonsil infection caused by the streptococcus bacteria. So strep throat is another term for acute bacterial tonsillitis. Now, if a child has multiple episodes of tonsillitis, we may recommend having your tonsils removed. And typically, when a child has tonsillitis, there's a series of symptoms that we look for. And the number one is just a sore throat. Sore throat is kind of the hallmark of tonsillitis. But the child may often have fevers, swelling, or white spots on the tonsils. And I will often ask parents, do you see white spots on your child's tonsil when they're sick? That indicates pus coming out of the tonsils, which probably means a bacterial infection. Do they have any node swelling in the neck or any lumps and bumps in the neck that are tender? You may hear some changes in the voice. And kids who have acute tonsillitis, like 
Okay, very uncomfortable to swallow. It's very uncomfortable to swallow when you have hot, swollen tonsils, and they'll complain of difficulty eating or swallowing. Now, in general, there have been some new guidelines that have recently been released within the last calendar year looking at when tonsillectomy should be performed. And the general recommendation for tonsillectomy for recurrent throat infections are kids who have seven infections in a year, five infections per year for two years in a row, or three infections per year for three years in a row. Now, those are not hard and fast guidelines, but they are things to think about. Um, so if your child starts to develop more than four or five episodes of strep and it's been two years in a row, or for three years in a row they've had two or three episodes of strep every year, then you may want to consider talking to your pediatrician about whether taking the tonsils out would be beneficial. And we do have some guidelines to help you go through that. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the most common thing that we see in kids is what we call sleep disordered breathing. And sleep disordered breathing is a kind of fancy way of saying a whole gamut of different illnesses or conditions, starting with primary snoring. So kids who just snore, and you may hear this in children who are snoring, but it can go all the way up to sleep apnea. And in sleep apnea, Apnea literally means cessation of breathing. Kids who have sleep apnea have snoring that's become so severe that they actually stop breathing. So what you will hear is something like this. Like that, where a child is actually trying to breathe, but cannot breathe adequately, and so they end up stop breathing. Now, it's thought that sleep disordered breathing may occur in up to 12% of children in the U.S., but more recent data suggests that it's probably a lot higher than that. And in children, the most common treatment is just removing the tonsils and adenoids. And I showed you some pictures of small tonsils and adenoids before, but look at these tonsils. They're huge. And when the tonsils are this big, when you fall asleep, they're just collapsing in the back of your throat, and you have no room to breathe. And that's why the child breathes like this. <coughs> There has been a lot of talk in the news lately, and you've probably seen a lot of this in the popular press, about the consequences of snoring and sleep disordered breathing. And now we know that kids who have snoring or sleep disordered breathing or restless sleep or sleep apnea as a result of difficulty breathing from airway obstruction are known to have long-term risk to their heart and lungs, but we are now starting to understand that those kids tend to have a higher incidence of attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity behaviors. They tend to do worse in school and tend to have more learning delays and tend to have more problems with bedwetting as they get older. So there are lots of consequences from snoring as well. And it's been shown that kids who have their tonsils and adenoids removed for snoring or sleep disordered breathing frequently will improve from a behavioral standpoint as a result. Now, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is performed a lot for these types of procedures. It's done about 60,000 times a year in the United States. Um, it's done under general anesthesia. Uh, the tonsils and adenoids are removed through the mouth. So again, there are no cuts on the outside and no scars that you can see on the outside. This is all just done through the mouth. And it is frequently done as outpatient surgery, but in certain children, like younger kids or kids who are at higher risk for medical conditions, they may be kept overnight in the hospital, but frequently it's done as outpatient surgeries. Now, as I mentioned, the reasons for taking out the tonsils include recurrent or chronic throat infections, sleep disordered breathing, or tonsillar asymmetry, where one tonsil is significantly larger than the other and we're concerned about what's going on. Here's a picture of big tonsils and what it looks like when we take them out surgically. You can see they're so large they're completely obstructing the child's airway, and that's why your child doesn't breathe very well at night because of the tonsils and adenoids. Now, Tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is not a particularly pleasant procedure, and there's a lot of kind of old kiddie books uh, that talk about this. You can expect that in the first 7 to 14 days, you're going to have a very bad sore throat, and that's the number one problem after you have your tonsils out, is that the kids have a lot of throat pain, and they transmit that pain to their ears, so they feel pain in their ears and their throat every time they try to swallow, and they don't want to eat very much. They will also get bad breath. They may have some snoring because of swelling from the, the surgery, which will go down over time and you may hear some changes in the voice, and they may have some pain uh, in the neck. The biggest risk after you have your tonsils out is bleeding from the throat, not during the surgery itself, but uh, after the surgery in the course of healing over two weeks, and your surgeon will give you specific information about things to do to reduce the risk of bleeding and what to do if bleeding occurs. But what we do know is that taking the tonsils and adenoids out for kids who have recurrent throat infections or behavioral issues or uh, snoring and breathing issues 
from big tonsils and adenoids show an improvement in their behavior and quality of life after the tonsils and adenoids were removed. I'm going to just show you some pictures of what the surgery involves because parents ask me about this a lot. I don't want to get into the great details, so I'm going to kind of fly through this. So this is just a picture from the side of what it looks like when we take out the tonsils and adenoids. We have a retractor to hold the mouth open and another retractor passed through the nose to pull the palate back so that we can see the adenoid. The adenoid's in the back of the nose, but it's hard to reach it through the nose itself because of the turbinates. So we typically go through the mouth itself and use a mirror to look up the back of the nose. And you can see, looking through the mirror, you'll actually be able to see up the back of the nose, and then we can use our instruments to remove the adenoids themselves. Um, this is our view from the mirror. You see the adenoid tissue. Here's the opening to the eustachian tube on either side, so you can see how the adenoid tissue is related to the eustachian tube. Here's the back of the nose, and this is our retractor and the uvula here. But here's the adenoid tissue that we're going to remove uh, to help the child's nasal obstruction. Uh, this is just a, a cartoon of the same thing. There are a bunch of different ways to take out the adenoids. You can ask your surgeon specifically about what they like to do. This is sort of an old school technique using a curette. And when you use the curette, you actually get the adenoid gland out as one giant lump of lymphoid tissue. And you can see it looks a lot like a tonsil. The adenoid is actually a tonsil in the back of the nose, sometimes called the nasopharyngeal tonsil. Same kind of tissue. And so you can take it out as one big lump uh, to help open up the nasal airway. Other people use something called a shaver, also known as a microdebrider, and in the microdebrider, you're just literally shaving down the adenoid tissue uh, to smooth it out. And the shaver just smooths out the adenoid tissue, it sucks it all out, and smooths this all down to remove any infected or enlarged adenoid tissue. Um, I do mine using what's called a cautery uh, method. I use this device called a suction electrocautery, and we melt out the adenoid tissue using a little heat so there's no bleeding and there's no actual cutting involved. It just melts away the adenoid tissue to get rid of it. And there are a bunch of different techniques, but I don't want to dwell on the details. Now, the tonsillectomy, and that's an operation that's been around for uh, thousands of years, uh, has gone through many, many iterations, and there are a million different ways to do it, and I don't want to get too caught up in the detail, but it is done through the the mouth, and you can see we use some retractors to hold the mouth and tongue open, and then we take the tonsil and we dissect it out from the tonsil and muscle around it. Some people do it using old school cold steel techniques, which are still very popular with a snare where you pop out the tonsil. Probably the most popular technique right now is using electrocautery, where we actually excise uh, the tonsil using an electrocautery device. Some people will smooth it down using the shaver or microdebrider, similar to what I showed you with the adenoid tissue. There has been some research into using laser for tonsillectomy. Most people have abandoned using the laser because it tends to cause increased complications. This is a picture of one of my tonsillectomies using what's called a coblator. A coblator is a radio frequency ablation wand. I use it because it seems to cause uh, a little bit less pain and discomfort in the kids after surgery. It makes for a very clean dissection for taking the tonsil out of the bed that surrounds the tonsil. So those are just some pictures of what tonsil surgery looks like. Some other day we can come back and talk about these kind of problems, including lumps and bumps in the mouth. This is a little cyst in the floor of the mouth called a ranula or a split palate. So this is what we call a submucous cleft palate, not all the way through and through. But that's subject for another day. Now, airway surgery is a big deal for us. And one of the reasons we do extra training in pediatric ear, nose, and throat is to specialize in airway disorders. And I don't want to get into too much detail about this. But let me say a couple different things. There are a lot of different common airway problems in kids. And the number one thing that your child may experience is laryngomalacia, which occurs in infants. But kids may also have little lumps and bumps on their vocal cords, including nodules, cysts, or papillomas, which are like warts. They may have a paralyzed vocal cord from some type of surgery or trauma, scarring beneath the vocal cord which is one of our big issues that we deal with is pediatric ear, nose, and throats. And of course, in kids, we always worry about foreign objects in the airway. And so you can see when we're talking about the airway here, we're talking about getting back behind the tongue and up into the part of the throat here, including the epiglottis, which protects the throat and the vocal cords and the voice box. So we'll take a look at a couple of pictures. This is what a typically normal airway looks like. And when we do uh, airway, uh, when we have airway concerns, we may do uh, uh, an endoscopy in the office where we put a little any camera down the nose to look at the voice box and windpipe. If there's concern for what's going on below the vocal cords, your surgeon may recommend that we go to the operating room to do what's called a bronchoscopy, where we place a telescope or a bronchoscope down through the vocal cords down to see the entire windpipe or trachea to where it opens up into both lungs. This is a pretty normal looking voice box. Here's the epiglottis that helps protect your vocal cords when you're swallowing. Here are your vocal cords here, and here's 
the area that we breathe through. Your vocal cords move and they come together when you make sound. And then we're always concerned for the area underneath the vocal cord for any sort of scarring uh, in that location. Um, laryngomalacia, as I mentioned, is the most common cause of noisy breathing in babies. And in laryngomalacia, the cartilage above the vocal cords is not very sturdy. And so those cartilages above the vocal cords collapse when you breathe. And you can see here that they collapse and fold over on themselves, which obstructs the airway. So instead of breathing normally, a child with laryngomalacia will frequently breathe in this sort of pattern where they go, <laughs> where they have this squeaky breathing when they breathe in. Laryngomalacia is often outgrown, and we will usually just sit and watch because most kids will outgrow it as they get older, and we may frequently treat for reflux, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but reflux is often a major issue in kids with airway concerns. Sometimes laryngomalacia can be more severe, and if it becomes severe enough that the child cannot gain weight appropriately or feed appropriately or is breathing poorly, we may consider surgery to release some of these area where the vocal cord cartilages are not moving appropriately to help improve the airway way temporarily. Um, some other time we'll come back and talk about these issues. This is what a nodule looks like on the vocal cord, and this is typically caused by too much shouting and screaming, and voice abuse causes you to get these little calluses on your vocal cords, which we call nodules, and those calluses cause you to get a hoarse voice. These are papillomas or warts caused by the human papilloma virus, which can be transmitted in utero from the mother, causing these growths on the vocal cord that affect the voice. This is some scar tissue below the vocal cord called subglottic stenosis, and this is narrowing below the vocal cords that can cause further uh, breathing or airway issues. And then finally, just a few words about neck masses. Neck masses in kids can either be present from birth, and those include things like cysts or drainage tracts. They can have malformations of the lymph tissue or of blood vessels called, called vascular malformations or lymphatic malformations. We can have infections affecting lymph nodes uh, that can affect various tissues in the neck, which can cause uh, uh, infections or even abscesses to form that require drainage. And of course, we always worry about lumps or tumors involving the lymph node, the thyroid gland, which sits down here in the front of the neck or any of the salivary glands. And all these different things can present as neck masses in kids, and neck masses in kids are one of the reasons that pediatric ENTs do what they do because we see so many of these. Now sometimes the kids have infections. You can see they're bright red and hot. They may have pus draining out of it or may require surgical excision or drainage. They can be born with lumps in the middle or on either side of the neck, and these are typically benign tumors that need to be removed. Or they can have these vascular or lymphatic malformations causing swelling in either side of the neck and there are different treatments for each types of these things. Um, I'm just going to close with a couple of pictures just to give you an idea. So people frequently think of a pediatric ear, nose, and throat surgeon. All I do is put in ear tubes all day. We do, in fact, uh, deal with some more serious things. This is a child who actually came to see me from the Caribbean who was born with a small swelling in her neck and over the course of two years developed this basketball-sized tumor growing out of her neck. And forgive the graphic photos, but um, we decided to proceed with surgical excision. And you can see we had to cut out all that excess skin. And here's a picture of the tumor as we were taking it out. There's the tumor itself. It turned out to be about the size of my two fists combined, and I have pretty big hands, so it was a pretty good-sized tumor. And once we took it out, you can see all the anatomy of the neck left behind, including some of the muscles and the major blood vessels and all the nerves and things that we managed to protect. So this is kind of one of the things that we specialize in, is taking care of these kids. And you can see she hasn't had her, her surgery to fix her cross eye yet, but you can see that her neck looks dramatically better now that we've taken uh, that gigantic tumor out of her neck. So that's just a quick, brief overview to Peter pediatric ear, nose, and throat disorders, including some of the most common things that we see. I hope that I've been able to answer some questions for you. My contact information is up here on this slide, including a website with our address.